Hello everyone and welcome back. This is part two of Inside the GT700. If you happen to miss part one, look back through my videos and you should be able to find it and get caught up. So today I'm gonna go back into the engine placement. I spent a lot of time getting this motor located as far back and down as possible. With the dry sump system and some modifications to the subframe, the engine is actually only one inch away from the bottom of the chassis and the front of the motor, which utilizes a motor plate similar to what drag cars do, uh, is a simple solution, um, but it also tied in the suspension stresses uh, through the chassis. By having this plate bolted here, it goes down to the lower subframe and back up, it triangulates, and all those forces from the control arms, which you can see right here, is tied in directly to that plate. So it takes all that movement ties it together which increases some uh, chassis rigidity you have to be careful when you start taking off all the framework like I did where there basically is no frame rail uh, ahead of the shock tower you gotta tie that back together to maintain the same strength that it had originally but this motor is located about two or three inches further back than the original 13B but it's almost 14 inches longer so the whole rear uh, area behind the firewall was removed and I basically re recreated a much deeper firewall. As far as the braking system goes, so these are AP Racing uh, hang pedal assemblies. So it has two, two brake master cylinders and this is a true brake biasing system. So each brake master is independent and has a balance bar internally on the brake pedal. Uh, with that, you have an external adjuster, so on the fly, you can adjust brake bias. Now, with the new bodywork, it got <laughs> much wider. This is uh, almost four, I think, four and a half inches wider in the front and pushing six inches wider in the rear. And um, I didn't want to just slap some deep dish wheels on it with the stock suspension. I fabricated much longer and wider tubular control arms. Okay, so I got the wheel off, and so you guys can really check out the front suspension. There's a ton of work that I put into this. So these control arms, like I said, were extended. And one thing you don't think about with extending control arms is, you know, so I made a jig, and that jig, you know, you position everything. You can't just grow the control arm straight out three or four inches or however long you're making it wider because these mounting points and the lower mounting points are not completely parallel. So if you were just to grow a control arm straight out in a jig, it actually would be moving your axis forward if these are actually slightly less than parallel. So I had to make a secondary jig that actually bolted into these mounting locations, take that jig off, measure it, and get a difference between the front and the rear and degrees. And once I knew that degree measurement, then I was able to actually extend the ball joint here on the outside in the exact direction, like keeping it exactly in the same geometry while growing the control arm. That's something that I feel, you know, you don't think about when you're initially going into making custom control arms uh, wider is how to maintain the exact relationship between the two. So lower control arm, upper control arm, that was all done the same way. This is the, the braking system, which, you know, this is a custom machined hat that slips over the monolug. This is the monolug uh, threaded main hub. Uh, these are the drive pins. There's five of them. They're actually in the same 5x114.3 bolt pattern, uh, but they just slip into the wheel, and that's what drives the force on either braking or acceleration in the rear. Um, then you just have the single lock nut that is torqued down to about 350 foot-pounds, uh, to hold the wheel on. This is a very unique and high-end brake caliber. This is a Brembo X9 monoblock, all CNC machined billet piece of aluminum. Uh, there is no seam here with bolts bolting it together and that increases rigidity and reduces unsprung weight. This caliber is extremely light despite how large it is. I mean this is my hand and it's as wide as my entire hand. The brake pads are one inches each thick, they're endurance pads. This is a very sticky compound, a uh, high friction compound brake pad that I'm running right now, and these rotors uh, are also made for endurance. This is an inch and a quarter thick rotor, and that dissipates heat 
extremely fast. I actually don't run any ducting. You can see these are not ducted. This is still an ARC-7 hub that's been modified as far as what bolts onto it. So I had machine adapters made, like this stem right here, to convert it over to a Heim joint style. It's the same degree taper that uses a K747 style ball joint because uh, I wanted something ultra heavy duty to handle all those forces of over two G's through corners and bumps and everything else. The Penske dampener, I mean, what's there to really say about that except that they're ultra amazing and these are four-way adjustable. There's high speed, low speed, bound and rebound adjustment. Right now I'm running 2200 pound springs, very stiff springs, and as you can also tell there is no sway bar, front or rear. That's something I'm going to add, I just haven't had a chance to. I'm going to put on blade style uh, cockpit adjustable bars. I actually have a blade uh, and I can change it inside the cabin. Stock mounting locations and uh, everything bolts on that. It's just a lot wider and relocated shock absorber. Again, I, I put this as close to the ball joint as I could. That just uh, increases stiffness because you're not getting any deflection through the control arm itself. Everything was made with as straight a tubing and triangulation as I could. This has a reduced steering angle because the tire will actually hit right here. Uh, it doesn't need it. Race cars, they don't need to turn around in a parking lot extremely tight. So by putting steering limiters in the steering rack. I'm able to achieve a straighter line right here. Mazda's actually had a arc on the control arm. And whenever you're dealing with a, a bend, even if you triangulate it, that's weaker than just straight lines distributing the force. So this is a very straight line from the outer ball joint all the way to the inner control arm. So that force is just transmitted directly. And you'll see very uh, quite a few poorly designed control arms, uh, no triangulation, uh, no straight lines and bends because they're either stylish. And as a result of that, you have to go a lot thicker on the tubing. This is only one inch, one inch tubing, 060 wall. It's extremely rigid. This is more rigid than the factory stuff. It can handle a tremendous amount of load. Uh, still using an RX-7 steering rack. And uh, there's a lot of RX-7 components still in it. I mean, the tub, you can see the tub right here. This is all factory, all the way down. I didn't modify any of this. Now I did have to cut out the upper frame rail that came across right here on top of the tire. Now with this new body, not only was it wider, it was way, way lower. Um, I think I dropped the car down uh, probably almost four inches or five inches from uh, factory height. With that being that low, with this large of a tire, frame rail occupied the same space as the tire. This would be right where the frame rail would be. Any kind of, uh, even at ride height, it was touching the frame. So I cut out the entire frame here and then basically reattached. So right on this plate, uh, fabricated plate here, I added tubing to reconnect to the shock tower. And then I have a, what I call a tripod arrangement onto the shock tower on this side. And that has a tube going across to the uh, dash bar. And there's also, if you can see it, a down tube right here. And that down tube goes all the way inside the car as well. All these tubes connect inside the chassis to the roll cage, uh, making it kind of semi-tubular. This car runs 335s in the front, 345s in the rear, and sometimes I've dropped down the size to a 305 in the front, a 325 in the rear. Uh, so I've been kind of playing around with tire sizes and seeing what's optimal. So probably one of the most special things about this car though is this front splitter. This is not a piece that I made or fabricated on my own. This is a Riley, a Riley front splitter, and it came off of a uh, Rolex 24 Daytona prototype. Uh, Daytona prototypes, if you look them up, they're uh, single-seater uh, cockpit prototype cars um, that run in the Rolex series back in, you know, I think 2004 to 2015 or 16. There's a few versions. This came off of a Gen 3. Daytona prototype, which was the largest and most aggressive um, aerodynamics that they had on the Daytonas. So I was really fortunate to get my hands on one of these. Uh, very thick. I mean, this is probably two inches thick. And inside of the carbon fiber is a honeycomb aluminum. So it's insanely, insanely strong. 
It has four mounting points. This is one right here, one on the other side, and it has two in the rear. This is the cross. Remember, I had to get creative with the ducting because it actually has to go around that tube. And that tube runs up and mounts right here to the chassis. This is direct force being applied right next to the shock tower that has all the reinforcements. There's a huge airfoil underneath with uh, two really big tunnels. When I put it on the lift, I'll kind of show that. But that's a real pro piece. Doesn't need any strut rods or anything externally. I can stand on this and even jump on it. And all it does is move the suspension. Uh, it's, it's very, very strong. No, uh, no give or flex whatsoever in it. So here's the underside of the front splitter, and you can see the 3D airfoil shape. And these are the two tunnels that transfer air upwards. It's really important on the relationship of how low the splitter is to the ground. If it's too high, it loses its effectiveness. So right aid is really crucial. These are the custom control arms. This is the lower control arm. This is a stock subframe that's been modified for a little more strength. I filled in the open area with sheet metal and dimple dyed it to uh, give a little more rigidity for the stresses that are going through it. You can see the subframe I cut into and uh, reinforced to let the engine sit even lower. So this is the bottom of the motor right here. This is the oil plate for the dry sump. And you can see that when I was talking about the one inch off the bottom of the chassis, the engine sits extremely low to the ground, super low center of gravity. This is the first time I'm showing the exhaust because I built it in a completely different way than usual. 